Welcome to our April Peel and Dres All Hands. Excited to give everyone an overview of what we've been up to in the past month. We'll start with our working group update, and then we'll go into a number of deep dives on Boost, data programs and Slingshot, client growth working group, and a number of upcoming events for our ecosystem that folks should be aware of. So as a reminder, um, we are one of many working groups in the PL network. We work to drive breakthroughs in computing and technology to push humanity forward. Um, and that's because we think the internet is one of humanity's most valuable technologies and making it stronger and better and run on more um, kind of user agency enabling primitives like content addressing is some of the most valuable work that we can be doing right now. Our mission as the NDRES working group is to scale and unlock new opportunities for IPFS, Falcon, LibDB and related protocols. And we do this by onboarding amazing developers, driving breakthroughs in protocol utility and capability and scaling the research development happening across the network openly and publicly. Um, so our work encompasses many of these amazing projects, as we mentioned, um, there's a, a whole ecosystem of them that we build and help push forward. Um, and we are made up of these 12, I think we may even have more at this point, um, teams within the PL Endres working group, um, working to drive new breakthroughs, um, improve areas of storage and retrieval reliability across IPFS and Filecoin, um, and generally uh, push this ecosystem forward. We have a number of open roles across our working group. Um, so if you are looking for an opportunity to join this 100 plus individual team of amazing humans, please, please do reach out to us. We have um, a job board here that you can, uh, can open up and look at some of these available roles from engineering managers to software engineers to TPMs, product managers, infra engineers, research engineers, scientists, data scientists, developer relations engineers, tech writers, community managers, and much more. If you're excited, please come reach out and join our community. Um, our strategy for uh, 2022 for the Android's Working Group is first to focus on the talent funnel, helping more amazing humans onboard onto these programs and um, help make these protocols better. Um, two, really focusing on robust storage and retrieval across IPFS and Filecoin, helping many new petabytes of useful data onboard to the Filecoin network um, and making sure that robust retrievals happen across IPFS and Filecoin to really help uh, scale adoption of these critical building, building blocks. Um, third, driving breakthroughs in programmability, scalability, and compute. This is a lot of our work around the Filecoin virtual machine, FBM, retrieval markets, consensus scalability, and uh, being able to do compute over data. And finally, and most importantly, making sure that these really critical networks are running smoothly and upgrading reliably, um, and that we kind of help burn down our technical and operational debt to make it easier and smoother to, to run them at scale going forward. Um, so handing it off to Adin for IPFS. Yeah. Um, one of the things we work on, as Molly mentioned, is IPFS, trying to make the web work in a peer-to-peer -peer way. Uh, content addressing is one of our big tools for this. Uh, we, we keep an eye on what's going on in the network. Um, number of peer-to-peer number of -peer -peer nodes is, is doing well. Uh, finding content, nothing, nothing too surprising is going on there. Um, still about half a second uh, for content routing. Um, we, uh, we've, been getting, we've been getting lots of PRs, uh, both, both from you know, core developers working on stuff and uh, community members who, who, are, who are sending more and more PRs uh, to help out, which is great. Uh, and we are trying to get those closed out. Um, so we've been getting been getting better and slowly trimming down our backlog there. So uh, let's go next. All right, what's been going on this month? So um, we had some security fixes uh, around IPFS 0.12, uh, 2, and 1. Um, there is a specification for a protocol called Reframe, which uh, is a request response protocol um, that will help us with things like delegated content routing. Um, we will we'll sort of hear more about that as it ends up in GoIPFS, which uh, will hopefully be coming uh, in the release in you know, next month. Um, we set up our first uh, implementers sync uh, for there are more implementations coming around uh, that are implementing uh, IPFS in their own way uh, and having a good place to, to chat with them about uh, protocol improvements and and some of the tough problems we we collectively face uh, has been nice and, and we're just getting started uh, the community calendar will have more um, 
yeah, lots of uh, other changes, uh, making gateways better. Uh, people have been asking for these for a while. Uh, the P2P resource management, which you'll hear about later, uh, and making codecs better. Um, generally, lots of lib2p things coming. Uh, and next month, uh, also working on data transfer. And I'll hand it off to the lib2p folks. Uh, JS first. Thank you. Yeah, so this is um, the Hollows, the JS IOP stack. Um, so we are in the end game, hopefully, of the uh, conversion of the P2P to TypeScript. So there is an RC that's available. Um, it was shipped at the end of last month. So you can get it right now if you install the P2P app next. Um, and so the, and so the net up to IPFS um, and making sure that all the components uh, integrate well. Um, so notably, uh, gossip sub is kind of the final core component that needs migrating. Um, there's a PR that's in progress and we're waiting for, for some reviews on that. Um, we also have some other features in the works. We've got uh, implementations of Yamux and Circuit Relay V2, um, which are hopefully going to be finished at some point in the near future. Um, and then, yeah, uh, rolling out to literally out to IPFS. So what's next? So yeah, uh, we're going to be publishing a roadmap of what's going to happen with JSRPFS. We want uh, it to be the best possible platform to build your distributed apps on uh, in all the possible environments you can run it on. It's going to be incredible. We're super excited. Um, uh, yeah, so improving the DHT support, um, making sure it's enabled by default and it works. It's enabled by default right now. Uh, in client mode, the extension of that will be uh, opening up in server mode. So that means also in that. Um, it's going to be amazing. We hope to get it to you very, very soon. Awesome. Over to Lib P2P folks. Yes, I'll give you some update on the P2P, the um, peer-to-peer networking stack. Uh, next slide, please. Um, OK, this was not supposed to be in the presentation, um, but OK, uh, we have um, a bunch of nodes uh, running in different networks, uh, in the, the IPFS network, in the Filecon network, um, uh, the Kusama network. Uh, you can see there's a it's pretty, pretty stable going up and down a little bit. Uh, next slide. Um, we, the, the entire the P2P team is currently in, in Paris and will be giving uh, a few talks on uh, tomorrow and, and on Saturday. Uh, Go to P2P introduced a product board that is linked here. So you can see what we are, what we are currently working on. Regarding um, our hole punching project, Project Flare, we've rolled out um, Go to P2P 0.19 where um, relay, um, relay v2 nodes are now automatically discovered, and this will, will ship with the next IPFS release. Um, this means that nodes will be able to automatically um, coordinate hole punches, which is really exciting. And we have a, um, a collabor collaboration with Dennis um, to measure those hole punch uh, success rates, and we'll, we'll probably see numbers there pretty soon. Um, quite excitingly, our team has grown. We've, uh, uh, we've now three new team members. Um, Elena has joined on the Rust side, Marco is, is uh, on the Go side, and uh, Melanie is currently in Launchpad. So what's up next? Um, for Go p 2 p we are continuing the ongoing effort of, of consolidating our repos. Uh, we are working on test ground testing to, to do more interrupt testing between different implementations. We are also working on a new protocol to migrate streams from one connection to another connection, which will, which will help us with, um, uh, with relayed connections. And we've started working on web transport and there's a, um, a draft spec and next up will be browser interrupt. Uh, on the Rust side, we're also working on, on test ground and uh, getting quick running in Rust and P2P. Awesome. Peter. Hello. Uh, yeah, that's a, a new slide, a new team. Uh, so I'm part of uh, IP developer experience team. That's, we came up with this name only like, two weeks ago. So it's quite new. There's two of us, me and Laurent. Uh, 
And what we want to do is to empower PL address to innovate by simplifying uh, the workflows that you go through every day. Uh, because there is only two of us, our immediate focus in on IP stewards, but we do want to, like our vision in, goes beyond that. And you can read more about that on our public notion page. And uh, yeah, uh, what do we do right now? Uh, we do have two bigger projects on our plate uh, at the moment. Uh, one of them is GitHub management. Uh, we want to <laughs> streamline, uh, streamline GitHub configuration management so that it's easier, safer, uh, and <laughs> in general, better. Uh, for, for everyone involved. And we want to drive GitHub configuration management through GitHub PR, PR workflows. And that project is ongoing. We do have a, an infrastructure set up for most of our GitHub organizations right now. And the next steps would be to reach out to developers and promote the new way of doing things. Uh, the other big project we are involved in is TestGround, where we collaborate with Bloxica uh, on the future of TestGround. And uh, more immediately, we are working closely together with LibP2P on uh, interoperability testing. Uh, and if you want to find us, uh, our public Notion page is a great source of information on everything we do. Uh, we try to be really open about it. Uh, we do have a channel in IPFS Discord and that's called IPDX. And we're also uh, quite active in TestGround slash dev. And we do have weekly office hours on Mondays at uh, 4 p.m. UTC time. Uh, that event is available on the PL Andres calendar. Uh, so check it out, join and, and say hi. And yeah, yeah uh, you can also uh, drop us an email on ipdx at protocol.ai. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Peter. I think Jennifer is currently on a flight, um, so I'll, I'll cover the Filecoin side unless she pops up into the side. Um, but as many folks know, um, Filecoin is a, a major endeavor here as well, looking at our top level KPIs, um, total network storage capacity continues to grow smoothly. Um, deals on Filecoin, I think are actually up by over a million deals since the last time we updated this, which is awesome, growing really quickly, um, which also corresponds with data stored on Filecoin. We are about to hit 7D, but we're currently at 69.999, which is pretty cool. Um, and we have crossed 60 million NFTs stored on Filecoin as well, which is great. So lots of growth. Um, Part of this also comes with an increased use of Snap Deals, the Filecoin upgrade that happened um, beginning of March. Um, and so with Lotus 1.15.2, which is going out, I believe, next week, um, the storage provider experience using Snap Deals has gotten a lot better. A lot of uh, UX fixes uh, happened within the, the protocol. And so that's um, helping uh, Snap Deals. Uh, increase in their usage throughout the network, which is great to see. Um, the Lotus team is hard at work on network V16, the skier upgrade, um, and getting uh, FEM development uh, uh, happening as part of that, which brings a lot of really, really important changes. Um, the Falcon Crypto team is focused on Halo 2 to um, bring even more recursion to our proofs, which can help us scale um, chain bandwidth significantly. Um, and then big, big snaps to the Bedrock team for launching Index Provider, which went out in Lotus 1.15.1. And so indexer nodes are now default indexing new storage providers in the Filecoin network, which is great. Um, there's also a new FIP for index providers. Um, and the FBM working group's really busy hardening and auditing all of the FBM work. Um, and so please check out the bug bounty program and audits if you wanna help contribute to that ongoing auditing work and help harden FBM and make sure it's gonna be a really secure and smooth upgrade for the whole network. Um, also big snaps to our friend, friends working on Boost, um, which is the reference implementation of the new markets protocol um, that's in testing with XVX program. Um, challenges for, for this area is just, there's a ton of development to happen on FBM land in order to land this M1 milestone. Um, so check out the tentative timeline that we're keeping up to date to make sure that it's gonna be a really secure 
um, upgrade to the network um, and lots of big thanks to the um, the Forest team who has um, kind of joined forces with the Lotus team to uh, rally together and improve test coverage over the new built-in Rust actors um, and just all of the other groups who are getting involved to help um, bring this milestone of FEM across the, the door. It's a, it's a big deal um, and a lot of help is happening there. Cool, and passing it off to NetOps for team updates. Hey, uh, this is Jesse. Um, NetOps, uh, the KPI is still keep going. Uh, we still get a uh, sort of as good as last time to say. <laughs> uh, we are working on to improve our TTFB to be uh, less than maybe five seconds, uh, hoping we can make something happen. Um, the ping and mark low is still increasing. You can see the number we are increasing to be uh, slowly. Um, the weekly IPFS uh, gateway request and the unique IPFS gateway user, we also increasing. Uh, we are have a checking to make sure our cluster can handle it and moving forward. Uh, our network update, sorry, network uptime, um, still fitting our need, 100% uh, for DRAN, the API train dot love 99.9. IPFS gateway is 99.9 90, 90, as well. Uh, all other things is 100%. Uh, we're still on chat, make sure we can support uh, another boost about the uh, usage of the IPFS. Uh, how about next? George. Yep. Hi, everyone. A few Bifrost team updates. Uh, so cluster version one uh, has landed and has been rolled out to Web3 storage. Uh, thank you, Hector, for that. It features improved uh, uh, memory usage, which allows us to tweak the bit flow parameters so we can increase transfer speeds. Uh, graphs look really good. Uh, like Jesse mentioned, IPFS Gateway has hit 950 million or close to a billion week requests. P95 were done to first byte is around six seconds. We're working on bringing that uh, lower to five seconds. Um, Mario has done some excellent work on the synthetic monitor, uh, which should help us uh, uh, investigate potential uh, bottlenecks in some of our regions by the gateways. Uh, he has also refactored uh, our metrics and alerts. Uh, we have a lot less noise now in the alerts channel and uh, alerts should actually be uh, actionable going forward since we also just hooked it up to Ops Genie. So it should be, uh, it should be a lot better than, than it was, at least less noisy. Also uh, opportunities, uh, we're in the process of upgrading IPFS um, uh, legacy nodes, uh, IPFS cluster legacy nodes in Web3 and NFT3 uh, storage to use Stripe disk volumes, XFS, next to last, uh, slash three shutting function, which should all result in better IO, which has been the biggest bottleneck for the clusters. Uh, for the gateways, we're upgrading to Nginx Plus, uh, which gives us uh, better uh, health checks, active health checks, uh, latency based traffic routing as opposed to uh, number of connection. Uh, which is what we're using now, active upstream uh, DNS refresh, which uh, will allow us to add more servers in a DNS record and load out, the load balancer would automatically discover them and start sending traffic to them. So that should help. And also it uh, should provide us with a, a ton more internal metrics, especially around caching, should help us investigate how our caching is doing and how we can uh, improve it. Also, we're, uh, we're tweaking our caching a little bit. We're introducing cache slicing for more efficient uh, 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 caching and, and retrieval and also cache locking, which uh, allows us to do byte range requests straight to the upstream server if a, uh, a file is not fully cached, should result in better, uh, better transfer speeds in time to first byte. And also we're putting together a dashboard in Grafana that's dedicated to the IPFS clusters, uh, which should, help with uh, investigating uh, when, when nodes are uh, under heavy load. Awesome stuff. Thank you. Mark, it's Phil and Pro. Hey, um, so one, one project that we started is uh, we GitOps. Uh, this is a GitHub driven way to manage Kubernetes clusters and applications. Uh, we have our first onboarding group going through that has stored the index. Sentinel and Phil Infra, and uh, store, store the index is the first one that will have a, a uh, operational cluster with, with application managed through GitOps. Uh, Sentinel is next up. Uh, we have the chain snapshot service, uh, the milestone one, which is uh, snapshots in, in S3 storage is nearing completion. Big thanks to Travis for his work on that. For API chain.love, uh, we have 100% uptime 
um, 164 million request serves and uh, served, and the average is uh, 63 requests per second over the last 30 days. And um, we are also uh, planning a version two, uh, so we'll have some some um, some in improvements on scalability and uh, performance there. And uh, Corey worked on an awesome uh, benchmarking tool so we can actually see if Lotus can support our uh, growth targets for chain.love. Uh, the opportunities that we have, um, we have a GitOps onboarding group number two that's scheduled for June. So for any teams that would like to move their application deployment or cluster management to a GitOps workflow, uh, please, contact me on uh, Phil Slack. And also for uh, chain.love, we expect to have better metrics on users so we can understand usage of it and uh, to, to instrument rate, rate uh, limiting on the lowest gateways. Um, and we also have a project lifecycle overview on our uh, Notion page. So you can check out where our various projects are at and there's links to, uh, to Notion docs for projects as well. Awesome, super cool. On to Forrest for Sentinel. Hey there, Forrest here with the Sentinel team. Uh, as a reminder, the Sentinel's team's mission is to provide software and data for monitoring analysis of the Filecoin chain. Updates this week, we released Lily v0.9 with support for Lotus 1.15. It enables experimental FEM support. We upgraded the core processing pipeline of Lily that increases throughput and observability. Some graphs showing that here. Way less go routines, way less data skipped. Um, we've also added support for chain reorg tracking and improved gap detection. In infrastructure land, we are migrating over to the Weaveworks Kubernetes deployments. We've updated our Helm charts for better use through the public. And we've migrated our Notion or our alerts to our Notion page. You can see that there. Coming up next, we're working on V0.10. Um, it's in progress right now. This will support distributed indexing, allowing it to be scaled horizontally so that we can process the chain in real time. We provided an architectural overview and are implementing this as we speak. Over to DRAND. Oh, I guess no DRAND right now. Maybe next week. Um, over to Nitro, David Choi. Hey, yeah. Um, so Nitro, we are the team that builds NFT storage and Web3 dot storage. Uh, quick highlights uh, for KPIs, and this is as of yesterday, four seven, not. February 2nd, uh, believe it or not. I used to make slides for a living for like eight hours a week. Uh, but anyway, NFT storage, cross 60 million uploads, as Molly mentioned. Uh, that's, uh, you know, it's just continuing to grow and grow. Team's super proud of it and, um, you know, uh, proud of what we're bringing to the ecosystem there. Um, other highlight is between NFT storage and Web3 storage, uh, combined 350 uh, tebibytes uh, uploaded to Filecoin. Um, so there's some crazy like heavy byte numbers for overall uh, Filecoin um, useful data upload numbers, and we're just a drop in the bucket there. But um, yeah, if you think about how small your average NFT is, uh, it's a uh, it's a lot of NFTs there. So um, you know, super happy to see that number growing. As far as highlights go, uh, one big highlight is that IPFS Elastic Provider uh, lives. Um, so it's the cloud native. Uh, IPFS implementation that we've been developing with Nearform, um, and it's providing NFT storage records to the DHT through the indexer nodes. Um, and it says historical ingest still in progress here for referencing historical NFT storage data, but I just got word that um, that historical ingest is complete. So we're going to do some testing on, you know, the retrievability and, and speed there and things like that in the coming weeks. Uh, this is one part of a just general new uploads interface that we've been working on. Uh, trying to um, just be uh, have more scalable infrastructure for both reads and writes. Um, it's making good progress. We're really combining the infrastructure between NFT storage and Web3 storage to be like the single upload interface. And as a result, it's going to be a little bit of time until um, NFT storage and Web3 storage can directly take advantage of this interface. Um, but we're going to hook Nifty Save up to it soon um, in the coming weeks. So that's super exciting. Um, and then also check up, check out NFT Up. Uh, it is a uh, desktop app that Alan created uh, as the easiest way to upload large directories to NFT.storage. So if you know of anyone doing like 10,000 
uh, PFP drops or NFTs and things like that, and it's many gigabytes of data in a directory, uh, point them to NFT up, and um, we've been getting rave reviews from users and a lot fewer questions from uh, non-engineer artists out there asking how they can use NFT.story. So a uh, huge thanks to Alan and Chris for making that happen. Um, and yeah, team is meeting in Miami next week for an onsite. Uh, super excited to see everyone in person. If uh, we are a little bit slower to respond, that's probably why. A uh, real quick call out on a challenge we experienced last week. Uh, we had our second uh, Google driven uh, gateway blockage um, in, I think, probably four weeks or so. Um, this time it was due to them uh, writing a bad regex statement uh, for Chrome safe browsing. Uh, this was like the same kind of thing that happened previously. They had promised this wouldn't happen again and we'd never get the whole NFT storage something uh, domain blocked. Uh, but, uh, you know, this kind of stuff does happen, does illustrate uh, the dangers of too much power on the internet with one body, even with the best of intentions. Uh, so we're publishing a blog post on our experience around this tomorrow and hoping to continue the dialogue from there about running a uh, IPFS gateway in a Web2 world. That's it. Awesome. Thanks, David. Over to Jacob for Bedrock. Hello. Uh, yeah, so Boost is getting ready for launch next month. Uh, so we're currently working on integrating with uh, downstream providers. So Astroware, we're hoping to integrate with them. They'll roll out uh, support for Boost next week. Uh, Textile launched support for Boost this week already, which is super awesome. So we're literally going to start testing folks who've already upgraded to Boost and are doing early, early adopters. Um, and on the store, the index side of things, as Molly mentioned, we launched the index providing in Lotus in 115.1. Um, so far, we've ingested uh, indexes from about 55 storage providers and currently at a rate, it fluctuates quite a bit, but we're ingesting billions of indexes per week so far, um, which has been quite a bit. Uh, we're rough estimations right now are about, that's about 10% of deal capacity on the network right now. Um, so rapidly increasing that. And with that, some of the work that we're gonna be doing uh, right now is working on planning out what the future of scaling looks like uh, so we can scale this horizontally as well as distributing it. Uh, one thing that's really nice in a highlight is that Ken Labs is now running an indexer. So we're getting more agencies to run indexers. So not just what the, the Bedrock team is running at CID.contact, but we'll get more indexers out into the network and then provide support for everyone to be able to scale those out horizontally over time so that we can support all the massive growth on Filecoin. Um, yeah, then we're also looking, we've been meeting with retrieval markets and storage providers uh, and a few other groups to understand retrieval priorities and storage scaling priorities. Had some really great discussions this week as well as last week in the Boost AMA, which I'll link to later in the, the deep dive. Um, and so we're looking at a lot of, as we get ready for Boost launch, after that, what can we do to help these large scale enterprise storage providers scale their system? So we're looking at splitting out markets, the markets process into, into multiple systems there. Uh, so very exciting. And yeah, I think that's most of the stuff. Woohoo! That's many things, and they're all awesome. So thanks so much for sharing. Over to Marco for Consensus Lab. Yeah, hi all. So on the Consensus Lab side, we have uh, wrapped, out the initial P wrapped up the initial POC of hierarchical consensus. Uh, basically, we have a bunch of demos. If you follow us on Mother of All Demo Days, we are usually taking up the first half an hour as Consensus Lab uh, presenting demos of, of the stuff that you're building. If you missed it, uh, they're all on the web. Uh, we have an accepted paper on hierarchical consensus architecture at uh, the DIMPS workshop. And now we are moving to productization. So first things there, this started in April. Uh, we shipped Udico Garden, which was crypto managing and spawning Udico testnets, uh, uh, basically on uh, AWS using AWS and Terraform. Uh, we have CIs and I test uh, now for Udico. And we are moving to, basically we are now at integration with FEM translating our two actors uh, from being native Filecoin actors to FVM. Uh, we are wrapping up this stage of uh, proof of uh, checkpoint and proof of stake uh, protocols to Bitcoin. This is a uh, uh, code name is Pikachu now. And basically we're wrapping up uh, with uh, uh, initial smaller scale uh, uh, deployment, which uses Bitcoin testnet and Filecoin KVS, uh, submitting paper just next week. 
And for consensus for UDICO subnets, we essentially have the POC of Tendermint running uh, as a consensus for UDICO subnet. And we are now fully staffed uh, to tackle uh, the big uh, project on efficient subnet consensus. So there we presented in Eurosys uh, just two weeks ago, one of the building blocks um, that we're going to use there. On the highlight side, hiring is uh, going super well. Sergey joined the uh, beginning of April as a uh, research engineer working on efficient subnet consensus, Project Y3. We have a new research scientist joining in July and one intern joining in May. And in addition to that, our uh, hiring pipeline is full. So essentially we have another three research engineers and one research scientist in the decision hiring thesis stage. We have the papers that I mentioned. We are collaborating intensively with CryptoEcon Lab on uh, hierarchical consensus CryptoEcon, uh, fleshing out uh, gas models and other things. And we are paying a lot of attention to impact and work in the open and community. Alfonso will give an invited talk uh, this year, Consensus Day is going to ship as CCS uh, 2022 workshop. Uh, CCS is basically the, the biggest security conference in the world. Uh, I have some PC co-chairing uh, duties. We launched Consensus Lab Discussions, which is a GitHub, essentially GitHub discussions, uh, basically wrapped as Consensus Lab Discussions, where we are using as a forum to discuss in the open our ideas and, and improvements of our protocols. Uh, so that's basically an uh, update on our side. We have also discussing with computer or data the right ways to leverage hierarchical consensus to uh, help uh, computer or data uh, basically improve its current stage. Let's put it this way. Thank you very much. Awesome, Marka. Well, if your uh, uh, research engineers and research scientists are watching, they should clearly jump in and join all this great work. Handing off to uh, Irene for CryptoNet Lab. Hi everyone. Sorry for my low voice, bad voice, but I got uh, a cold. Um, so today, I instead of giving an update of the project that CryptoNet Lab is working, I want to use my two minutes to show you uh, the um, prototype of a project that is the Data Retrievability Oracle. The goal of this project project to, is to guarantee retrieval from a decentralized storage network like Filecoin. And we know that we have uh, incentive and penalization for providers for guarantee the storage, but we do not have these tools for retrieval. So here the goal is to uh, add these tools and, and, and the same guarantees for retrievability. And um, what it makes this uh, very hard to do is that there is not an equivalent for retrievability as the proof of space time and the guarantees that proof of space time this 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 gives for storage. We don't have such proof of delivery for retrievability, so we have to find the other solution. For example, we have to overcome this impossibility problem, possibility result with the retrievability oracle that attests if a file is being uh, retrieved by the provider or not, and in the negative case can slash. In our <clears throat> in our M M MVP project, the Oracle is implemented by a set of referees that are semi-trusted, so we only trust a part of them. And these referees, they basically ask again a very smart way the file, and uh, they have the, the, the power to slash or not the provider if this provider is not basically uh, retrieving the correct file. And the, 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 there are a lot of details and subtleties here that I'm not telling you, but uh, they are very important to have something that is uh, uh, basically scalable, uh, doesn't have a big uh, on-chain footprint, and can uh, work with, with a web scale. And uh, what I want to do now is to show you, since this is live now, we have a smart contract implementing this on testnet, testnet live. Uh, I want to show the video that, uh, uh, that, that is a demo about our prototype. Thank you. Hi there, this is a quick overview of the prototype we built. On the, on the right, you can see the provider. And on the, um, on the bottom part, we can see the referees. Um, on the left part, there's the uh, user interface, minimal user interface, where uh, you can all enter and try by yourself the, uh, how the deal works. And of course, there's the contract already. What we can do now, right now is create proposals and uh, ask for ask for appeals. Uh, now we are creating a quick proposal. Yeah. 
we can quit our controls out there and now we can we will see that everything will work automatically and uh, nothing else uh, anyone can try it and yeah anyone can try it and just uh, understand what, what what's going on thank you awesome thank you Renee. that's super awesome and great to see a live demo on testnet cool um now we're into our spotlights on um, awesome things that have shipped in the past month, starting with Lotus. I think we still maybe are missing a, a Jennifer since she's on a plane. I can hop in here. This is highlighting the um, most recent shipped version of Lotus 1.15.1, which has um, experimental FBM support and also the indexer provider on by default and the upcoming 1.15.2, which has a lot of things that have been um, heavily requested by the storage provider community, um, window post workers, I think these are actually window um, and winning post workers, um, which help you uh, kind of scale your proving process, um, uh, enhance to the um, ceiling scheduler, and a lot of improvements to snap deals, which make um, doing those in the, the live network uh, much, much easier and much better UX uh, for storage providers. So um, lots in these latest Lotus feature releases to enjoy. On to Wes for the Computer for Data Summit. Thanks, Molly. Uh, can you hear me okay? All good. Awesome. Thank you so much. You know, we, had, we were very uh, fortunate to have a few days in Paris earlier this month to bring together a number of service providers, a number of technology partners, a small group of us from the Back of Yale team to really talk about what has been done in this space previously? What's the history? And one, give us a good start, just kind of giving a sense of the history of compute over data. We learned from other partners that had tried to implement their own ad hoc solutions to, to distribute compute over data. We were lucky to have other folks from the crypto econ team and a number of other groups to kind of weigh in on considerations we should have as we start to build this. But really, this was the first uh, time for everyone to get together and sort of start a community around this compute over data project. Um, so after a series of sort of prepared lectures and day one, day two was more of an informal unconference session. There's a lot of considerations that we need to start planning for related to security and uh, reproducibility of the data sets, uh, verification of the data. And so we're talking about different trade-offs and the architecture. It was uh, a lot of fun and uh, we, had, we were fortunate to have some really smart people there with us. Um, but the biggest takeaway is that we definitely have the interest of the storage providers and, and that'll be critical from the compute layer. As we build out back Yao, um, we want to really think about a lot of the architecture was built around the concept of pluggability. So if we do verification, we want to allow people to plug in their own verification. We want to support as many different runtimes as possible. Things like Wasm are really growing in popularity. Um, and so I think we have a good kind of sense of the initial considerations that we want to build out for the next couple months. And as you can see here, the goal is just to get the system up and running so we can do nice demos. Leading into the next few months, we're going to be focusing more on outbound and getting user validation of the system. So we'll be highlighting each month, trying to get one notable research academic user into the system. And then as you can see, we've got some longer term goals here for the next few months after that. But we are off to the races. And if anyone would like to contribute or find out more information, we do have the Notion summary link there. All of our code is also public on the Filecoin page. So we'd love to have your opinions and, uh, and feedback as we build it out. Awesome. ZX and Alex, Crypto Econ Lab Summit. Great. Hey, this is Alex uh, for Crypto Econ Lab. Just want to review what we did on our Crypto Econ Lab Summit. It was the first time that we had all met in person. Um, our lab is now, when we add one more person, we'll have grown 200% in the first three months of the year. So uh, a lot of onboarding and keeping busy there. Um, we've decided now that we have this new capacity to split our work streams. Uh, we had previously had everybody working on everything approach. Uh, a lot of that was due to the fact that uh, some of us were new to the uh, area and needed to catch up. But now I think we can split things into different work threads and they're listed right here. Hierarchical consensus, uh, et cetera, working on Project Atlas in a way to met, uh, marry Filecoin with geospatial processing, which seems to be a very natural um, marriage there. 
Uh, I won't go into the details there. One thing we did do is to uh, have our first uh, ever crypto econ day uh, summit at DevConnect. We had 60 attendees uh, and 11 talks. Um, we scheduled this pretty quickly, uh, and I think we can do a much better job going forward. Uh, we are looking to now do a quarterly uh, Filecoin economics day, uh, and so at uh, major conferences. So we're working on that. And with that, I will um, turn it back. Awesome. Good learning there on using summits like this as an opportunity to get to know people who might want to join the team. I feel like it's a good lesson for other, other teams as well. Thank you. Passing to Raul. Go ahead. Hello, this is Raul from the FEM team. Uh, the FEM team had a long and needed colo in Amsterdam for three weeks. Uh, it's ending, It's actually ending tomorrow. We're still here. Uh, the same time has been crucial to work through some critical items for the M for the upcoming M1 milestone and also to flesh out the scope and work uh, breakdown for M2. Uh, as a result, the gas parameters for FIP32 are almost finalized um, and probably an update to the draft FIP is coming, uh, coming in tomorrow. Uh, we also made a ton of progress with uh, various hardening uh, work streams for M1, including the ones listed here. Um, and we also worked through the NB16 testing and deployment timeline with the Lotus team and the infra teams, um, had many product conversations around DBM and native uh, scoping and the development experience uh, prioritization there. Um, and also had the opportunity to connect uh, with several collaborators, including the Fission team uh, to discuss uh, technical uh, design uh, details for the Filecoin EBM implementation. Awesome. Patrick, Retrieval Markets. Hello. Um, yes, we have, uh, we've had a Retrieval Markets and we'll specifically Saturn Colo uh, this week in Amsterdam as well. Uh, one week of the Saturn team being here. On Tuesday, we had a Retrieval Markets workshop intro to Saturn. Uh, we had four speakers and over 30 people watching or attending the event. Uh, similar learnings to what Alex mentioned for the Crypto Econ Day. Uh, learned a lot about how to put on an event in the last minute, and there's lots of learnings to take in doing it again in the future. Uh, we've also had the team, MyL team, join for the last two days, which has been great. It's, it's great to have the Saturn and MyL team in the same place. And even though they're building their own networks, they've been breaking bread together and sharing stories of building retrieval networks. So it's all been very happy. Uh, major takeaways is that we've got a much clearer route towards uh, launch for Saturn. Uh, and we've, it was also great to hang out with some of the crypto economics team uh, earlier in the week uh, and make progress in that space too. Uh, as Jake mentioned as well, we had a, a meeting with the Bedrock team, um, at, at Bedrock X Retrieval Markets, and we uh, yeah, covered a lot of interesting things. Uh, so it's been a great week um, and things are much more clear for the future. Awesome. Great looking roadmap uh, for, for the next couple of months as well. Over to Patar for Edelweiss. Hi, everyone. So I want to make a quick announcement of a developer tool that we've built called Edelweiss, which is um, an extensive RPC protocol compiler based on IPOD. Uh, this tool is now production ready at its first milestone. And it's generally meant to streamline the process of defining formally future protocols as well as legacy ones. Um, it has a lot of features which you can read about on the GitHub repo uh, and it's quite flexible. Uh, our current um, adopters soon to be in production are a few projects, some in the IPFS ecosystem, so Hydra and IPFS itself, as well as store the, store the index from the Filecoin ecosystem. Uh, feel free to reach out if you want to learn more about it. Thank you. Awesome. Great to see that launching. Cool. In the remainder of our time, we want to run through these deep dives, starting with Boost. All right. I'll try to be quick. Uh, so yes, Boost, the new version of the Markets Protocol, 
uh, for Lotus that currently supports. It's going to be a tool for storage providers as well as some client tooling um, that includes the existing version of the deal protocol v11 and also introduces a new version of the deal protocol v12 that allows you to select data transfer and gives us some other neat types. Uh, when we were building out Boost, one of the things that we wanted to do for storage providers was give them access to more information into their system. So this is a currently a design mockup for the UI and what we wanted to showcase is the availability of information. While the web UI is really good for small scale miners that don't have a lot going on, as we've been talking with very large enterprise storage providers, uh, this gets very challenging for them. But the advantage is there's a GraphQL endpoint that they'll be able to curl and query and we can build CI, CLI tooling on uh, so that they can start operating on you know massive scales of tens of thousands of deals. Um, so this is really good. Um, and so we can move on to the next slide. With this, as I mentioned, we introduced new data transfer protocols for storage. Uh, one of these comes with HTTP transfers. So we have a lot of folks who are building car files and uploading those to servers like S3 to then transfer them over to storage providers. And so what we built is a, a way to make that into an online deal. So now when you're negotiating, you can say, uh, hey, here's my car file, here's the comp for it go grab it, the storage provider will immediately download and store that file. Um, the nice thing I mentioned earlier, Textile has shipped support with this, which has been really nice because they've had to pull in a lot of these data and serve it to storage providers themselves. Um, and now what we've done is skipped all of that gap so they can just say, hey, storage provider, the car files over here, go get it, make the deal. Um, and we've also seen some, some 20x speed improvements in some of the initial tests for folks over the current storage protocol uh, speed, which is really good. Also. We added support for the HTTP over LibP2P protocol uh, that's been around in LibP2P for a while. And this allows a very lightweight streaming protocol. And so we've been working with the Estuary team, uh, with the ARG team to integrate into field client and Estuary. And so our goal is to roll that out next week and start testing with some of these storage providers. Um, and over the, all this whole process for, for both uh, textile and for estuary, they're able to fall back to v11. So for folks who haven't upgraded to boost yet, it's not a problem. They can use the legacy protocol um, and move on with their day. Next slide. So with this, there's boost.filecoin.io. We've got a bunch of docs there um, and we'll be adding tutorials as well and try to create as much information there as possible. Um, we also released some utility commands with Boost. So there's a Boost client, which folks can use to execute and make deals, check deal statuses, things like that. And then we also have a Boost X utilities command. Um, we discovered that people were going around and trying to figure out like different tools to build their car files and to calculate comp and all of that. And so we tried to bring all of that tooling to Boost so that it makes making deals much easier to do. Um, for folks who don't know what CID Gravity is, CID Gravity is tooling that's built on top of the Lotus process to allow folks to kind of automatically configure their storage providers to, you know, handle certain deal rejections, do certain analysis, and we've been working with them and they've already updated to support the latest for Boost, which will give them some additional information to continue to build tooling, because one of the things that we want to do with Boost was allow more extensibility of these underlying processes. And this kind of showcases the support that we're doing there. Next slide. So there's a link here to the storage provider AMA demo we did last week. Uh, we don't have enough time to go into the demo here, uh, but it was about 15 minutes and you can see Anton going through the whole deal flow process. You can see a lot of what's going on in the UI, see all the new snap deal stuff in use, which is really great. Um, and then on in terms of rollout, we're gonna be announcing a beta phase for early adopters in the next couple of weeks. We wanna finish up integration uh, rollout with Estuary before we roll into that. Um, and then we're aiming for that full launch in mid-May. Uh, and then with prepping for launch, we're also starting to look at what's next. So working on scaling for these large enterprise storage providers so that they can handle onboarding, you know, hundreds of terabytes of, of deals per day. Um, and then also looking at uh, planning various support for either HTTP and or free retrieval for BitSwap. Um, so more to come. If you want to follow along, join the Boost uh, channel on Flackle and Slack. Thanks. Woohoo! Thanks so much. Passing over to Deep for Slingshot. Hey, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I'm going to try to keep this a little quick because I know we still have at least three more sets, including this one to get through, and about six minutes to go. Um, so yeah, uh, most of you are already familiar with what uh, Slingshot is. Um, 
community program for processors and preparers and, and, and search providers really to onboard lots of open, interesting data sets to the Falcon network. We kicked this off right around mainnet uh, and are nearing and crossing actually 37 petabytes as of today of data onboarded over the, the course of the program. Uh, we're currently in phase 2.8 of this program, which will likely be the last or if not the penultimate phase for this uh, before we transition to something more interesting uh, and unique, which I'll be sharing uh, towards the end of my little section here. Uh, the current focuses right now are to try and get this up to 40 petabytes of data onboarded. We're currently at about 61-ish uh, unique puppy bytes. We'd like to bring that number up closer to 65. Uh, and all of that is visible in this data explorer that we have on the website as well, which is linked here. Uh, last and definitely not least focuses right now on this are on improving and increasing the quality of the work and the baseline uh, for the standard of how current participants are sort of adding to the network, adding to the programs and ensuring that the data that's being onboarded is retrievable. Next slide. So the reason this is labeled programs and not slingshot is because I also want to walk you through some of the other components that we've been working on that sort of partner as part of this group of things that come together and how they all tie together. Uh, the first of which is recovery. You probably heard of this in December where we had a data loss incident, uh, which resulted in us coming up with a, a slingshot recovery umbrella within, with which had, sorry, which had two separate programs within it. Uh, one of which being restore, where the data needed to be sourced from outside the network because we completely lost the replicas that we had and needed to go back to the original sources. And the other being repair, where we had at least one replica of a specific CID available within the network. And we wanted to come up with an automated self-healing mechanism to identify that, fetch that replica, and find a way to incentivize rebuilding of those replicas. In, in a similar vein, uh, at the end of March, we, lost, uh, we launched a program called Slingshot Evergreen, which is an initiative to guarantee the permanence of the data that's been ordered onboarded to the Slingshot program. So I mentioned, you know, Slingshot's been around for about 18 months. That is also the deal term for many of the deals that started happening near mainnet. Um, and we sort of kicked this off just in time to ensure that data that was onboarded isn't going to be lost from the Falcon network. And so the idea here is that we ensure at least 10 replicas that are very thoroughly geo-distributed are available for the next several years of this data and ideally you know, forever. Uh, that, that word is definitely loaded. Um, and I'm sure some of you are already buzzing and thinking about implications with regards to the FEM and stuff. And absolutely, yes, we're super interested uh, in that. Uh, but right now where we're at is we're doing a bunch of KYC on storage providers that want to specifically participate in replica building for these CIDs. And using CIDs as the main mechanism to identify subsets of a data set that are nearing expiry to ensure continuation of the availability of that data long-term. Next slide. Um, and so why am I telling you about all this and what are we working on today? Uh, so in the last couple of minutes here, I just want to touch on the, a, a few of the different work streams that we're prioritizing at the moment. Firstly, on the recovery front, it's definitely still a work in progress. We're reaching about six petabytes of data brought back onto the network. We still have about that much to go. So we're working on extending some participants in the restore program with following grants for what we define as hard to reach data sets. So these are cases in which like the original provider of the data can't provide it to us as easily anymore. Examples are AWS decided to stop subsidizing hosting that data as part of their open registry. Uh, call back to David Choi's comment earlier, not super great when we have centralized decision makers on the internet, we wanna provide an option that exists for the long term for free as well as we can. Two, in certain cases, because of like real life events, some scientific data became hard to obtain. Like a good example is uh, we had an organization, I believe in Italy, that's doing like a data center migration for their stuff, which is like satellite data. And so we need to wait for that. And then the connections aren't super fast. And so coordinating and working with these individual organizations to bring on replicas onto the Falcon network is a compelling and interesting for us to chase down. Second, I mentioned the data set explorer. It's about to get a super cool overhaul, both from a design standpoint, but also from an accessibility and development standpoint. We're also thinking about integration with Project Backlayout and seeing if there are ways in which we can remote trigger the operations of compute uh, on this work way into the future. So lots of interesting thinking happening on that front. Third, I want to call out the retrieval success rate side of things on Slingshot. This is a super important metric for us. We, in every phase, we sample all the data that's being onboarded for retrieval retrievability. Uh, and we think that that needs to scale into all the programs as well as even beyond the program. So we're thinking of ways in which we can provide that as an API. And hopefully we might become part of, uh, you know, the presentation that happened uh, from the, the crypto econ lab as well and see how we can put it, put in some of that data into what they're looking at. 
And last, I want to chat a little bit about what we're currently referring to as the data preservation DAO. Uh, Molly, if you don't mind switching to the next slide, I'll show you my little spaghetti diagram. Awesome. So what is data, pro data preservation DAO or like what are we had to do with Slingshot V3? So I just talked you through a bunch of the different components. And what's interesting about them is that they all come together to actually build a set of services that can work really nicely together to build an engine that pushes data through the network, ensures that it's always available, and ensures that it's self-healing in the case that it's lost. So specifically, we've got the Slingshot program with some evolutions will become a really nice onboarding mechanism for data sets that people are interested in onboarding to the network. We've got Evergreen that ensures that it's not lost on the network. We've got Restore and it's some components uh, to ensure that if it is lost, we have mechanisms to self-heal. We've got a mechanism to test retrievability and ensure that the, there's quality in how it's being accessed and that it is available for people that want it. And then we have an explorer to find and actually use the stored data sets. And so we're looking at interesting incentivization mechanisms uh, and bringing all of these components together in what we're sort of currently terming as a data preservation DAO to build a, uh, a machine, effectively a machine, hopefully leveraging uh, these components as well as other developments happening in the Falcon network uh, to onboard useful open data sets to Falcon forever. Thanks for the time. If you're interested, please reach out. We'd love to pick your brain on your ideas. Woohoo. Um, sounds amazing. Very, very excited for that. Um, to move right along, Joao for Client Growth Working Group. Awesome work, Deep. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Ron Fiodairo, and I'm working with Deep uh, and David on expanding the, the man side of Filecoin. So uh, our team is responsible for driving organic adoption of Filecoin by seamlessly onboarding petabyte scale data. And we'll do that uh, by focusing on utility and demonstrating exactly what users get and clients get from our network, on process, focusing on making things more seamless and more frictionless, and more importantly, on tooling, laying the foundations for a robust and composable pipeline for um, ingesting data onto the pipeline, onto the network. So on the next slide, I talk a little bit about what I've been caring a lot about since I joined Protocol Labs, which is metrics, metrics, metrics. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And so particularly I care about the pirate metrics, R, acquisition, activation, retention, referral, and maybe one day revenue. So I, you know, we're trying to create a, a team that is able to measure everything we care about so we can really um, scale this, the demand uh, of our solution. In the next slide, I talk a little bit about what I've been working on over the past few weeks, which is getting things together connecting key data sources um, across product marketing and the onboarding funnel so that we can actually measure our client growth funnel. Um, on HubSpot, understanding these organic inbound leads through Filecoin, uh, large data.filecoin.io, and then understanding um, how our folks, our engineers are helping clients onboard to the, to, to the network. And of course, um, on GitHub, understanding how clients are going through the data cap provisioning process. So the TLDR here is we've launched a, um, an awesome dashboard that compri is comprised of all these different data sources and really shows us uh, week on week, day on day, how our client, how our, um, our demand side of the network is growing. And the next slide, we can actually start focusing on the key acquisition funnel, right? How are users navigating through each of these key steps uh, from being aware of our product to actually being qualified, to actually onboarding through a proof of concept and then being happy onboarded clients. Um, so next slide, I present a little bit of some of our awesome opportunities. Uh, Woohoo, we have a first view into our acquisition funnel. Uh, this allows us to dive really deep into the different stages of the data onboarding process for large clients and really refine product opportunities. And most importantly, we can also be very open and transparent at PL and publicly, uh, hopefully, um, with our growth ambitions and how clients are actually finding us and using our product. Um, a couple of challenges. It's really difficult to consolidate and clean the data from so many different sources. We still have to instrument a ton of things, inbound leads from different sources, different states um, in terms of quality of service during and after onboarding. Um, we have to ensure that our numbers are bulletproof. Garbage in, garbage out, that won't do. Well, we need to make sure that these things are reliable 
And finally, we need to um, separate client acquisition by initiative so we can really tell who gets more credit, me or deep. I'm just kidding. Um, but we really have to understand how programs are, are contributing to our growth and really be able to point to the ROI of these different initiatives. So thank you so much for bearing with me. Uh, please reach out um, if you have any questions. Uh, the dashboard exists uh, right now. It's, it's internal. So just ping me for, for access details. Thank you so much. Awesome. Helping people onboard on Filecoin is a, a major, a major initiative. And there's so many different ways that we can focus on it. So getting better data and visibility into where people get stuck, how we can build new tools or improve the products so they can help um, help people onboard successfully is awesome. So thank you for getting us that visibility job. Thanks, Molly. Cool. Um, quick index on upcoming events. As you've heard, many of these teams have been getting together over the past couple of months, which has been amazing. So we want to get together with the whole community as well and make sure that we're engaging with everyone who's viewing this asynchronously. Um, want to index on two great lists of community events that folks can check out if they are excited engaging with IPFS, Filecoin, LibPDP communities. Um, one is all of the amazing hackathons that are happening across IPFS and Filecoin. Um, this is at uh, events.filecoin.io or hackathons.filecoin.io. There's a ton of things happening here, um, probably like you know 10 plus things per month. Um, so definitely get involved there. Um, also the uh, Filecoin Foundation and the distributed web has a list of upcoming community events, um, which includes lots of group meetups um, and other gatherings. So two places to find upcoming events if you're looking for them. To let you know about three in particular, first there's Paris P2P, which is happening this weekend that the Lib P2P team is doing a whole ton of presentations at. Um, definitely tune in there if you're in the Paris area this weekend. Please stop by and say hi. Um, would be super fun to, to meet more folks in person. Um, Phil Austin is coming up in June, June 8th. There'll be a ton of people from across the community. We'll be having our next Colo Week for the Launchpad program there too. Um, if you're interested in speaking, there is a form that will stick in the, the YouTube channel as well. Um, and we'd love to see a lot of people there in Austin. And then finally, IPFS Camp 2.0 or 2020 is happening later this year, um, July 14th through 17th in Amsterdam. So super excited to bring back together the amazing community that gathered for IPFS Camp 2019 in Barcelona um, and definitely start gearing up, start thinking about the things that you wanna present and the deep disgu design discussions and workshops that we wanna to host to help push the whole IPFS ecosystem forward. Awesome, thanks for tuning in. I hope everyone is having an awesome uh, week and uh, great seeing you all.